Okay, I want to go through the use of Molista, which is right here, um, in Scripture so that you can see the difference between how Josephus uses the term and how it's used in the Bible. Because this helps you realize that the Bible's books are um, earlier or um, do not reflect the changes in speech that uh, Josephus uses, and it's kind of important. Okay, he, in Bible Works, I'm using Bible Works 5 here. In Bible Works, if you want to search on just a word, you first highlight it, and then you click on it. Looks like it's not going to work. Yeah, there it is. Okay, now the problem in Bible Works 5, and you'll have this problem maybe in Bible Works 8 as well. Let me get rid of the, the lexical window here. Is that when you're searching on a particular language version, all the versions are searched. And therefore here, where it's like John 9.30, Melista does not appear. Okay, it's in modern Greek, and this is really important, not in ancient Greek. Okay, so the Bible works is searching on the modern Greek translations as well as the ancient Greek, and the two are very different languages now. Um, in order to give me this listing of what verses contain Melista, uh, Melista in the New Testament. I'm restricting it to the New Testament for now. So you skip that. You skip that. See, here's the modern Greek down here in the lower left-hand corner. That's modern Greek. So it's used in modern Greek, not in ancient. Okay. Here again, um, modern See, here's modern. These are ancient Greek. The other texts are all ancient. This is the only modern one in my that I've put in my library. Okay, because I like to compare. So none of these verses in the Bible actually have Melista in them that are showing the right-hand side of the screen. But the word does appear, and this is Acts 20.38. It was written by Luke um, sometime between 58 and 62 A.D., and the reason you know that, there are a lot of reasons you know that, but one of the reasons you know that is because Luke terminates the book of Acts with Paul going to Rome. And Paul went to Rome in chains about 58 A.D. according to scholars. I'm still working on whether it was really 58 A.D. or sooner, um, but the scholarly consensus, which is not necessarily correct, is uh, somewhere around 58-59 A.D. So if Luke is writing right at the same time, then you could date the book earlier. But if he's writing like with the termination of Paul going to Rome, if he's writing retrospectively, then you could argue that um, Acts is written in 58, 59 AD, which is what scholars typically do. Okay, here you've got Melista used, okay? And you got some translations there, and then the other, um, you know, the other ancient, Bible text with this being the exception. This is modern Greek. Okay, just so that you know, because if you're not familiar with my videos, you won't know. Okay, this is the new, um, the NASB translation. This is the Vulgate, because I like to compare the Latin. Okay, um, this is Bible Works' own New Testament, which is really a combination of um, the commonly UBS4 Greek New Testament and um, they're editing. This is the Byzantine, which is um, Byzantine manuscripts were, uh, they're of the same family as the Textus Receptus, but there's, they differ a lot in certain respects. This is modern Greek right here. This is Scrivener. Scrivener is the latest edition of the Textus Receptus. It's uh, just at the turn of the 20th century that it came out. Okay, this is Stephanus. This is Tischendorf. This is Westcott Hort, which was popular in the 19th century, but is not popular now. There's really not a whole lot of difference between any of them, to be honest. Okay, Bart Ehrman likes to make an issue of the different spellings of words and calls each different spelling a mistake. Like in the UK, they spell it tire, T-Y-R-E, but in the United States, they spell it tire, T-I-R-E. Okay, that's not a mistake. But Bart Ehrman will call it a mistake. Bart Ehrman's scholarship is very bogus. 
it's it's really a shame because he's a nice guy I like him but um, he likes to play games with scholarship and he therefore makes scholarship look bad but the point is is that these these texts have been around you know this is like these are like Middle Ages texts this is going all the way back pretty much to the to fourth century AD third and fourth century AD mostly fourth because a lot of the manuscripts were destroyed in the third century uh, AD especially under Diocletian this is Scrivener this is based on medieval texts that uh, Erasmus compiled and it, they've been correcting them for 400 years ever since because Erasmus did a rush job this is Stephanus about 1550 this is Tischendorf there's a whole story just look up Tischendorf in Google he's a great there's a great story about how he found that manuscript. And this is Westcott Hort, which is using basically the UBS. Okay, so what I'm trying to say here is that the media on which this text was written is 4th century AD, generally speaking. But that's not how you date a language. You date a language by the way words are used. In other words, I have a copy of Shakespeare sitting on my bookcase. Okay, it was published, I want to say it was 1990 or so, huge book of all of Shakespeare's work. That doesn't mean that Shakespeare didn't write until the 1990s. It's still Shakespearean English. You can tell from the way the words are used. Okay, same thing is true for, for Bible text or any other kind of text. You date it by the way the words are used. Now, there's another way to date it, which scholars don't know about yet, but it's documentable, and I've been documenting it now for five years. Each Bible book, each writer of a Bible book, datelines his own text. I've shown examples of that in Psalm 90, um, Isaiah 53, uh, Daniel 9, um, the Magnificat, and Ephesians 1, 3-14, Paul. Paul datelines Ephesians. And this is at variance with the scholars. Paul datelines Ephesians as 56 AD. So he was still in Jerusalem at the time he wrote to the Ephesians. Or our, our chronology of when he wrote Ephesians is off for other reasons. And I'm still investigating that so I don't have a firm answer. Therefore, it's reasonable to say, as you're going to see, that the book of Acts is written in the late 50s. Um, AD also. And that's especially true because Josephus uses this word here, Melista, in a different way from the way the Bible uses it. Now, what I had said in the last increment was that Melista, this, this ending here, the Ista ending, this is a superlative ending. It was not used in educated Greek at all. Okay? You didn't do that. That would be like saying bestest then you'll be marking yourself as an uneducated person who didn't learn the language properly. However, and you can check on this in Google, this particular use of Melista, which you're going to see me go over several times in this increment, this particular use of Melista goes all the way back to Homer. It is a almost like a hapax legomena, meaning it's a one-word use Okay, hypoxagomena really isn't the right term to use. But it's a one word use of a word as, how do you want to call it? Um, an adverb. An adverb is, is something that modifies either a verb or an adjective um, that has something to do with time or a when. It answers the question when or it answers the question where. Okay? This signifies first in importance, above all, most of all. Homer used it that way. Demosthenes used it that way. Aristotle used it that way. Um, and of course, Homer used it that way. But it's a singular use of the term. In other words, it by itself, Melista by itself, used the way you're seeing it used here. See? Translated especially. Okay. It's just that word used that way to mean like especially or above others or most of all or higher than the rest okay it's it's a special word used a special way 
consistently from Homer forward. That's what's important about this word that helps you date Bible books. It isn't the only word, obviously, that you'd use to date a Bible or any other book, but it is a key word for using dating. That's why I'm making this video. Okay, so when it says, especially over the word, that's right here. Malista, epi, toi, logoi. Okay, that means especially over the word. Especially over the news would be a better English translation. Okay, especially over the news. Okay, in context, Paul is having his bad hair day. Oh, I'm going to go die for Jesus. Okay, which is what, you know, Luke and his wry style is, is leading up to in Acts 21. You know, because Paul is all feeling sorry for himself and he's he's totally out of fellowship at this point. And so this particular verse is, is talking about that. Okay, so it's just used as an adverb, especially, grieving especially. See, here's the verb, grieving. And here's the word modifying it, especially, above all. So it's an adverb. It's an adverbial use of melista. That has a tradition of usage in the Greek language going all the way back to Homer. It is a dramatic word because the word ista is used. In other words, like in modern English or most other languages I know of, if you keep on using exclamation points and you keep on using superlatives, you kill the uh, stun value of whatever it is you're trying to say. So words like melista were used rarely, and that's exactly what you find in Greek literature. It is used to really highlight something above other stuff. Okay, it's also used as a figure of speech when you're making bullet points, like when Demosthenes runs his arguments. Okay, he, he ranks points that he's making, and when he wants to stress which point is the most important in his speeches, then he uses melista, but it's rarely used for stun value, okay? It's like some people use the F word, okay? A lot of people overuse the F word and they prove themselves to be childish. But in the proper place, the F word has a lot of stun value, okay? It's a, a kind of idea like that. You use melista rarely, most of all, especially, okay? especially in English, just doesn't carry that force. So we don't, in translation, we don't get the, the force that is being given to it in the book of Acts. Okay, but in the book of Acts, he stresses it. See, it's Acts 20, 38, then again in Acts 25. Okay, and this in particular is a fawning guy talking to um, uh, Agrippa, okay? And then, so he's using Melista to, to, to show his fawningness. But see, it's the same thing. He, especially there is modifying brought. Okay? And he's using, he's being real obsequious, so that's why he's using Melista. Okay? I mean, you can read the context behind these verses. I don't have time to cover all the context in this video. Okay? And then we have Acts 26 again, okay? And again, it's fawning, especially because, oh, you're such an expert in all the customs and questions among the Jews. Here, Paul is using the term. Okay? He's playing on all the fawning in an Oriental culture. You were supposed to fawn like that. You were considered respectable only if you did that, especially when you were in front of a king. Okay? He's talking to Agrippa, too. All right, so Paul's starting his defense when he says, you know, I beg you to listen to me patiently, which is, you know, pretty cool. This is coming from Macrothemia. I really should show the Greek words, I mean the lexicon, shouldn't I? Because you're not familiar with the Greek here. I'll just cover up the other texts. And maybe you want to see the Latin. Okay, this is Macrothemia. Magrothumas in this particular case. That, that's an obsequious word too. It means long suffering. Okay, macro means long and thumia means to stand under. Instead of being angry, you're standing under it. That's something I need to learn. Okay, 
All right, so these are the three uses, and, and this is a book that's written about events in the 50s AD, okay, late 50s AD, and it's also compiled, composed in the late 50s AD. And you'll notice Melista is used, not before, really important, not before, see? There's no gospel that's got the word in it, because I searched on all the uses of Melista in the New Testament. And it's not even used in the book of Acts, okay? It's used in modern Greek, which is why those verses even appear in the search results, okay? It's not even used in the book of Acts, sorry, the window's going funky, um, until Acts 20:38, which is not showing up well. Wait a minute. This is a problem in, in Bible works. It's not showing up until Acts 20. All right, so it started to be a popular word, an obsequious word, but it was still used in its classical Homeric sense of especially, but it starts to get this obsequiousness. It starts to become more common. So this tells you that in the 50s AD, and this is about the time when Josephus, well, he was born probably around 30 AD from what I can gather. This is when he would have been achieving his manhood. He would have been like 20 at the time. So you can understand why Josephus uses Melista, but he uses it in a different way, as I'll show you. Okay? But it starts to become a popular word here, especially in Jerusalem. Even Paul is using it right here. That's Paul talking. All right? But Romans is written before. Now this is this is what I mean about how you can date Bible books. Romans is written before Acts. Romans was written um, probably you know two, three, four years before the Book of Acts. It's it's really during the time Paul wrote Romans that he got out of fellowship. You can see that in Romans 15. My pastor spent a lot of time exegeting that to show the path of how Paul got out of fellowship. Um, the lessons are lesson 15:41. In 1992 spiritual dynamics you can get it for free from my pastor if you want to follow the exegesis Paul starts going out of fellowship in Romans 15 but he's not using Melista that way so it was not a common word to use okay even in the old Homeric sense it wasn't common because Paul's not using it see here's Corinthians that's about 49 AD here's 2nd Corinthians that's a couple of years later but Galatians, which is also 49, 49, 50, somewhere in that, that vein, does use it. So it's not unknown, okay? But this particular construction, Malista De, is replacing the more common in that day, Malon De, Malon Da, Da is a particle of contrast. Okay, you should be able to see something of that in the lower left-hand corner. I'm not looking at the lexicon. Okay, but when I highlight the word, the lexicon will show up. Okay, it's a post-positive conjunction particle, and it, it serves to introduce my, what's usually called by scholars mild contrast. Okay, but the usual expression was malonde, and that goes all the way back to Homer also. But here we got malista. Okay, so it, you can see that around 50, roughly 50 AD, the term Melista was starting to be used, but it's coming out of the Homeric Malonde construction. It's coming out, it's starting to be replacing, okay, Malon, which means rather, usually translated rather in English, famously used in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and 10. Okay? But this is the more classical construction, except that usually it's malo, not melista. But, but Homer does use melista. Okay, so what I'm trying to get at here is, is because of this ending here, it, it, it's laying special emphasis on it. So when it says especially, he's trying to stress especially. In English, it just doesn't have that flow and that force. Okay, the next time Paul uses it is in Philippians. Now, this is one of the prison epistles. So this is 
somewhere between 62, 64 AD, maybe as early as 60. You, uh, are you getting the point here? That Melista comes into usage sometime around 50 AD, because that's about when Galatians is written. It, it's not at all in 1 Corinthians or Romans, which are either earlier books or even contemporaneous. Okay, so it's not frequent. All right, so we're starting to see a change in the frequency of Melista, but still with its connotation going back to Homer of especially and as a phrase. Okay, specifically Melista Day, which is a version of Malon Day. Okay, I'm not bothering to pronounce the Greek correctly. Okay, next usage is in Philippians 4.22. Okay, again, Paul is stressing it. So it starts to be a sort of, I don't know, slang isn't quite the right word. A neologism, which really isn't quite the right word either. It starts to become a popular word between the 50s and the 60s AD. This is when Josephus was a young man before he became a general. He was either in his teens or he was in his early 20s. So because I'm leading up to what Josephus actually does with it to show the change. Okay, 1 Thessalonians is also written later. Okay, well, it's not even in there. I'm sorry, earlier. It's not even in there. But Timothy is written between is written while Paul's in prison. And it's written about 60, 62 AD. Paul is in Rome when he writes Timothy. Okay, and look at how common it is now. Again, what I'm saying in all this is not conclusive, but it is what, he will, what the scholar would call suggestive. It's enough in occurrence of the word in a specific time frame to be suggestive. Okay, and what you'd have to do if you wanted to be a really good scholar is you'd have to compare the word melista and all other stuff that we have in Greek extant for the same period. Okay, but, but I just want to show that even with this suggestiveness, the classical Homeric use of it as especially, okay, see, especially of believers, this is the classical Homeric use where he's using it as an adverb, see, here's the verb, used as a, a participle, well, well it's an adjectival participle, okay, verbal noun, verbal adjective, a lot of that happening. But he starts to use it a lot in Timothy. Look, to 1 Timothy 4.10. He's using it the same way throughout. 1 Timothy 5.8. 1 Timothy 5.17. I gave you the names of the verses in the last video, but I didn't show you the text. Now I'm showing you the text so you can pause it and research it yourself. Okay, again, classical use of Melista as a special word standing on its own. Okay, and then here's another one. Above all, the parchments. In other words, Paul wanted his copies of the Bible parchments he had delivered to him by Timothy for his last day in jail. Okay, and this is going to be really, this is a really important verse because this is how you can date the book of Hebrews as coming out in the year of the four emperors. Because Timothy went to Paul just before Paul's execution. This is a verse where Paul's asking him to do so. Okay. And then in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 13, verse 23, it says that Timothy was released from prison. Yeah, because in the year of the four emperors, just after Paul was executed, about six months later, Nero was executed, and that's what kicked off the year of the four emperors. Okay, Timothy was released because on the ascension of a new emperor, one of the things that they always did was release prisoners, especially prisoners who's kind of, who's you know, legality of being in prison was not quite right. And that was true for Timothy, because all Timothy did was visit Paul. That doesn't make him a criminal. Okay, so Timothy is released in Hebrews 11, um, uh, 13, verse 23. So that's how we know that 2 Timothy is written about 60, what, 62, not 62, maybe 66 AD, maybe 67 AD. Okay, because it would take maybe two, three months for Timothy to get there with all the instructions Paul was giving him. And notice how common Melista is in First and Second Timothy. The letters are a couple of years apart, I want to say, maybe not. I have to think about that or re-examine it. Okay, Titus. 
Titus is another prison epistle written in the 60s AD. Early, very early, 60s AD. Okay, because Paul gets out of prison in 64, and then he goes back into prison, um, maybe 66. Okay, so maybe there's a year or two between these two letters. Okay, I have to look at that again. I'm talking off the top of my head, and I could be wrong about the dates. Okay, and then Philemon, that's another prison epistle. Okay, these are all Paul's writings. Look at how common Melista is now. It is still used in its classical Homeric sense of especially as a standalone word by itself. That is not how Josephus will use it. That's key to what I'm trying to show you here. Okay, and then the next time it's used is by Peter, who's also writing in the 60s AD, just before he dies. So that might be 66, 68, somewhere in that vicinity. Okay, I, I'm, I have to still establish whether Peter was executed before or after Paul, but it was somewhere within 12 months. Okay, Book of Jude, Peter, and Hebrews are all written at the same time, within a year of each other. And I, I'm still working on, you know, which book comes last. Oh, and Mark's Gospel. So Mark was carrying all this material, because Mark was with Timothy. And I still have to do more investigating on that. Okay, so Peter is using Melista. So all this stuff tells you that the word is still used in its Homeric sense, but it wasn't popular or frequent in usage until the 50s. Because you got Acts there, which is the late 50s. You got, you got Galatians, which is probably at the beginning of 50, 49, 50, somewhere in that region. Okay? And then you got, you got, Phil, uh, Philippians, which is definitely in the 60s AD, early 60s AD, very early. Okay, and then Timothy, where, you know, oh, it's not in Thessalonians, that's in modern Greek only. But in Timothy, it's frequently used relative to how little it was used before. And that's also, you know, this is late 60s, like 66, 68. This is Titus, which is 60, 62, something like that. So you see, you can date these letters by the way the, the words are used. And it's not conclusive, what I'm telling you, based solely on Melista. There are a lot of other facts you have to examine. But I just wanted to show you sort of like the mechanics of how you can tell that certain words apply to certain times in a language, okay? And after that, well, they're not much used. Like, we use in English the word 9-11. That term, 9-11, for the destruction of the Twin Towers, was not used prior to the destruction of the Twin Towers. Okay? So, if somebody's looking at English, you know, a thousand years from now, they're going to be able to do with 9-11 what I'm doing with Melista to help show the dating of when the word started to be used. 9-11 was a term used to mean something else prior to the destruction of the Twin Towers. You with me on that? 9-11 meant dialing a, an emergency number or it meant a date prior to the destruction of the Ten Towers. With the destruction of the Ten Towers, the term 9-11 came to mean the destruction of the Ten Towers. The same is shown, the same sort of idea essence of the idea is with Melista. Here it's being shown in its traditional usage, but even the traditional usage wasn't in popular speech until about the 50s, 60s AD, somewhere like that, when Josephus was becoming a man. All right? Now in the next increment I'm going to go through how Josephus uses it, or uh, no, in the next increment I'm going to go through the more traditional use of what was standing for Melista because this is not the traditional usage for the for what we're calling here especially this was not commonly used this way they had other ways of saying the same thing that are in that's in the Bible to show that the Bible books are older okay I'm going to show that and then I'm going to show the very big difference in the way Josephus uses the term so that's what's upcoming in the next increment